and I'm a professor of music here at Columbia, and last year I was the resident faculty director at the Institute for Ideas and Imagination at the Columbia Global Center in Reed Hall um, in Paris. And this evening, we're going to continue a conversation that actually started last spring when the four speakers that you see tonight were fellows in the inaugural class of the Institute for Ideas and Imagination. We had a particularly lively discussion after a seminar that Karen Van Dyke led on her book In Progress about the role of migration and translingualism, translation in literature about and by the Greek diaspora. And I suggested that we should bring this energy and this, this excitement back to campus and really to continue the conversation and to share the ideas also with the Columbia community. So the four presenters this evening work in different languages also different character sets, and they work in complementary ways. And we're going to be hearing them speak about the role of translation um, in its broadest set of definitions in their scholarly and artistic practices. And then we will also engage in a four-way conversation and finally a conversation also with you, the audience. So I'd like to introduce the four speakers very, very briefly because many of the salient points that they'll make will come out in their own presentations. Each will speak for about 15 minutes. Um, so Karen Van Dyke, our first presenter, sorry? 15 to 20. 15 to 20. But if you say 15, it's always 20, right. So Karen Van Dyke is the Chimon A. Dukas Professor of Hellenic Studies at Columbia. Her monographs include Austerity Measures, The New Greek Poetry, most recently, and Cassandra and the Censors, Greek Poetry Since 1967. She is co-editor of A Century of Greek Poetry and um, also of The Greek Poets, Homer to the Present. And she's published numerous translations and scholarship on diaspora literature, the language question, translation, and multilingualism, and is herself also a poet. Xiaolu Guo, a second speaker, is a writer and a filmmaker from China who has resided in Britain since 2002. And she's published numerous poems, short stories, and novels in both Chinese and English. Her autobiography, Nine Continents, a memoir in and out of China, won the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award. Translation has been important to her practice since her first novel in English, a concise Chinese-English dictionary for lovers, which was published in 2007. And this year, she is a uh, visiting professor of writing and East Asian studies. So she's in the School of the Arts and the Department of uh, the ELAC Department at Columbia. And this evening, she's going to be discussing migrant writers' use of a second language to express their histories and illustrate ways in which writers play with time and grammar to express different points of view. Our third speaker will be Zaid Jabri, who's a composer originally from Damascus, Syria. After teaching for many years in Poland, he was resident composer at the Norwegian Institute of Science and Technology, and this year he's a fellow here in the Hyman Center for the Humanities. His music has been performed throughout Europe, North America, and the Arab world. He's composed two operas, two libretti, by Yvette Christiansi, who was with us this evening, and Rosalind Morris. And the second of those operas, Southern Crux, was his project last year at the Institute for Ideas and Imagination. Today he'll be speaking about his strategies of translation and transliteration in composing vocal music, drawing on a variety of alphabets and languages, and taking into account the performance of the text. And then our fourth speaker is Kayama Glover, professor of French and Africana Studies at Barnard College. She's the author of Haiti Unbound, a spiritualist challenge to the post-colonial canon, and has translated several works from French into English, including Honquetienne's Ready to Burst, Marie Chauvet's Dance on the Volcano, and more, most recently, René de Castre, um, de Castre Adriana in All My Dreams. And rumor has it that we have a copy this evening that we could pass around a little bit later in the, <laughs> in the session. She has a forthcoming book uh, entitled Disorderly Women on Caribbean Community and the Ethics of Self-Regard, and her project last year at the Institute was a biography of Marie really Best. This evening, she's going to address the ethics of literary translation as an act of representation within contexts of material and social disparity, focusing on the stakes and the practice of translating Adriana dans tous mes rêves. So we have a really exciting lineup of thinkers and speakers and um, um, translators with us this evening, and I'm excited uh, to hear what they're going to say. And let's turn it over to Karen Van Dyke. Thank you so much, Susan, for the, for the idea and also for um, being our fearless leader last year. And also, yes, <laughs> thank you, Eileen and the Heyman Center at Kate for hosting us. Um, 
I thought I'd outline the points that I made that got this conversation going in Paris. In particular, my view that diaspora literature, with its attention to translingual practices, such as transliteration, has important lessons for translation. Then in the discussion, if we have time, we can explore how the case of the Greek diaspora with its different alphabet is and isn't like the experiences of Shalou and Zaid with their different scripts and alphabets, but also how modern Greek literature is and isn't like Kayama's case of Haitian literature, where difference is first and foremost a question of race. How does race figure into representations of Greek migrants in America? Might having a different looking alphabet and the concomitant confusion, it's all Greek to me, be a cipher for looking and sounding non-standard for all sorts of reasons, race, ethnicity, class, gender, and certainly this is true in a lot of the literature that I'm looking at. And what are the ethics uh, involved in registering or not registering these shifts in our translations? So that's kind of what I'd like to come back to. But what do I mean by liter a diaspora literature's lessons for translation? Uh, diaspora literature gets much of its force from importing foreign languages and displaying the effort of translation as the stuff of literature. It impresses upon national literatures the importance of multilingualism, infusing them with a linguistic materiality that gives them the ability to conjure using all five senses. And we have lots of examples here. I'm thinking of Sholu's wonderful concise Chinese English dictionary for lovers. Um, you can think of other ones, Henry Roth's uh, Call It Sleep, Teresa Hat Kwan Chath, Dicte, many of them. The experience of moving from one country to another seems to trigger a multi-sensory and synesthetic response. The migrant is aware of everything because everything is information for survival. Diaspora literature exhibits this urgency. Importing foreign languages is effective because as is often more common in poetry than in prose, it not only gives us instructions about how to imagine other worlds, but actually recreates the sounds and sights of other places. Writing so that an accent can be heard, visually playing with a different alphabet, introducing loan words, may not create the immediate sensory experience of listening to music or looking at a painting, but for writing on a page, it is strikingly palpable. The wager I am making is that the multi-sensory palpability of diaspora literature has something important to teach translation. It can offer translators a range of examples of how languages are written into one another. It can offer translators, um, by honoring translingual and transcultural interaction, it can show us how to create logics that don't rely exclusively on the source or target language as the measure of fluency. In this new hybrid palimpsest context, the criticism that a translation doesn't read well, that it is foreign sounding, awkward, needs re-examining. If the rules have been rewritten, the usual quibbles about infelicity no longer hold. Um, diaspora literature teaches us that what is between worlds can become acceptable at least for the duration of the text we are reading, and that this also can be something that we might expect translations to do, or that translations are doing. As the Greek-American poet Olga Brumas shows us in both her poetry and translations, Greek shapes her English. In her poem, Artemis, from her collection, Beginning with O, it is like a curviform alphabet that defies decoding appears to consist of vowels beginning with O, the Omega, horseshoe, the cave of sound. Her mix of Greek and English, what tiny fragments survive mangled into our language, provides the blueprint for what she calls a politics of transliteration. And this is also true of her translations of the poetry of the Nobel laureate Odysseus Elitis, which homophonically recreates Sound patterning. And this is Xespasis uh, Orthias Thalases Don Colpasmo in Brumus's translation becomes uncovered standing seas full gallop. 
Rumus's invitation to think about translingualism, in particular transliteration and homophony, as generative for translation is the impetus for my project. There is something important that translators can learn from the way she carries over the curviform alphabet, the vowel, vowel, voweliness, the rhythms of Greek into English. But also, um, there are other examples from the novelist Irimi Spanilu, who's got this kind of weird sounding elliptical literal translations of Greek proverbs, um, the Greek American, the kind of accent of the performing artist Diamanda Galas, who uses Greek American to kind of bend and mix heavy metal with uh, a, a traditional form of romantica or lament in Greece. And I know that all of us in this room have our own examples of these kinds of going between languages. These writers don't imagine they are bringing over the whole other language. They are selective, right? That's what I think is most striking about their examples, is that, that, that the linguistic idioms and shifts of register deployed by them are selective. Um, Rather than they choose a mode for registering the difference between languages, whether an alphabet, a word order, or an accent, and then they repeat it like meter or rhythm until it catches on. So uh, this is the, the you know one of the things is that palpability, the multilingual, multisensory thing, and the other thing that I'm struck by that we can learn as translators is how you're not bringing it all over. <laughs> you're you're it's a very you're very you're you're learning te techniques from how this translingual literature works. If we were to model translations on diaspora literature, translations too would have to choose. They would have to make their interpretations visible and acknowledge that they weren't returning us in some unmediated way to the source language and culture. They would have to acknowledge the parameters of their selectivity. For a translation to feel smooth or jarring, translators would have to make specific decisions about how much and why certain things from one language were deemed productive in another. It wouldn't be acceptable to say, oh, it's because it was that way in the original. Isolating invariants and attempting to recreate them is wishful thinking, instrumentalist, as Lawrence Pernuti argues. An invariant, by definition, belongs to the self culture. Variants, on the other hand, he points out. And I would add, echoing Olga Brumus, how these vowel sounds survive mangled into our language are what translators can work with. Multilingual literature, particularly the self-conscious kind that calls attention to itself as translingual, provides a rich trove of variants. Mm -hmm. Brumas turns the openness of the Greek O and A sound into um, something that energizes American feminist poetry, as she explains in a rampage against the schwa, that, that O sound of standard American English. The only reasons my poems are the way they are is because when I see an A, I say an ah. I don't say <laughs> uh. For me, American is American, as if I had an accent. I don't have an accent, but I hear vowels, and I see vowels. And when I write, I'm aware of what the vowels are doing. If your vowels as a writer are all uh, then you're only going to have predictable end rhymes, if you have rhyme <laughs> at all. But if you're aware of your ahs, then you're going to be aware of all your a's. Hers is a transliterated language. It is a practice of retonguing, as the Greek word for transliteration, metaglottismos, suggests. Metaglottizing. It is something that happens in the body, almost like a French kiss, she adds in an interview. The fact that her collection, beginning with O, was the first by a non-native speaker to win the Yale Younger Poets Prize shows that her Greekized English wasn't understood as not knowing English, but rather as an innovative contribution to American poetry. Similarly, her elitist translations of his poetry, but also his essays, create a context for American readers to make elitist surrealism, surrealism their own through translingual meters and visual puns. A central lesson of diaspora literature for translation is that a translation can be at home in its foreignness and foreign in its domestication. In fact, there are myriad ways of creating a range of effects that are not limited to one extreme or another. These effects are speculative, not prescriptive. They're experiments, not a set bag of tricks. But I think what's important here is that readers can think along with this and, and try to begin to think about how a translation is doing this. In a more translation-aware world, 
book reviewers would notice them instead of focusing on word-for-word -word mistakes and expecting translations to give us back the source text in some unmediated fashion. Ultimately, translations fail not because they are strange or awkward, but because they don't teach us to accept their reasons for creating their variation from standard discourse. Diaspora's literature's insistence on acknowledging the multifarious hybridity of language, its meta-attention to literature as translational, is why it can be such an important research for translation. While my intellectual starting point was Brumus's politics of transliteration in America, the larger project that came out of this line of inquiry begins and ends in Europe and the Balkans in the 1880s and 90s before Greeks left for America, and then in the 1980s and 90s when Greece became the receiver of migrants rather than the sender. This time frame allows me to point out similarities between two fin de siècle moments so that diasporic multilingual porousness bookends the more familiar American 20th century story of immigrant monolingual assimilation mm. and makes everything in between. That whole story starts to look quite different. Um, my point is that different types of movement among places, diasporic, immigrant, exilic, Imagine different kinds of translation that emphasize different ways of moving among languages, multilingually, monolingually, translingually, and that paying attention to such patterns is not only a resource for alternative translation practices, but also for imagining alternative social policies, ways out of the impasses of xenophobia and ethnocentrism. Thinking among and in between places and languages can make us more tolerant to of difference and more aware of unacknowledged similarities, what I call unexpected collaboration. The examples I focused on in my Paris talk were the final chapter of the book. Um, two immigrant itineraries and their representation in contemporary Greek fiction provide a comparative site for this discussion of translingualism and translation. Thanasis Valtinos' 1972 novella, The Book of Andreas Cordopatis, Part One, America, follows a migrant, Cordopatis, from his hometown in the Peloponnese to the United States during the first decade of the 20th century. Sotiris Dimitrios' 1993 novel, May Your Name Be Blessed, address the more recent, addresses the more recent migration of a boy with mixed heritage born in Albania to Greek parents who returns to Greece after the Albanian communist regime ends in 1991. Although these novels represent different periods of migration, their forms of linguistic hybridity have striking resemblances. In both creoles, such as Gringlish and Graubanian, create shared spaces between languages that resonate for two or more communities. These works offer different but interrelated answers to the question of how narratives of migration represent translingual practices that are themselves translational. In the first, the representation of Gringlish relies more on transliteration, writing the sounds of one alphabet in another to point up issues of illiteracy, untranslatability, and the bureaucracy migrants face. And uh, Cordovatis actually never really makes it. He ends up having to be sent home to Greece. Um, in the second, the, rest of the, re the representation of Galbanian relies more on homophony, sharing sounds within and across languages to point to the common vocabularies, soundscapes, and spaces that inevitably evolve when people of different backgrounds live in proximity to each other. So there's a kind of American story and a Balkan story. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of these translingual practices that emerge in these narratives, so that we might see, like Brumus's translingual vowels and rhythms, how they could be useful to us as translators. I'm just going to read a definition of transliteration and one of homophony, just so we kind of know what that is. I mean, I think most of us know because we think about it, but um, um, transliteration gives prominence to the practice of writing and the look of the alphabet. In linguistic terms, it is the substitution of a letter or sign from one alphabet from a letter or sign in another alphabet, such as the substitution of the Latin S for the Greek sigma. It connects two languages through similar sound and visual patterns so that a word or phrase can be said, repeated, written down, but not necessarily understood. I mean, of course, when it gets to things like suvlaki and kimchi, we begin to know because it becomes something that is recognizable in the receiving culture. But at first, suvlaki is not known, right? So that's 
that's the, what, the kind of thing that transliteration does that's very different than translation, where there really is a corresponding meaning of, in, in the other language. <laughs> Homophony is a broader, more encompassing category. It exists interlingually between languages with different um, or the same alphabets, as well as intralingually within the same alphabet. So something like Suvlaki and Suvlaki are homophones, but so are, you know, Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty. That was for you. And interlingually, <laughs> liar and liar, or something like that. So um, it, it's a much broader category. My task was to analyze the narratives for their translingual poetics, then to look at how existing translations dealt, or in this, most of the cases, ignored this aspect. And um, what I found difficult about that was that it really depoliticized the projects of both of these, these texts. And finally, to come up with my own experimental translations that showed how learning from tr transliteration and homophony might lead to visually and acoustic, uh, acoustically arresting translations that could maybe take on the political challenge of representing migration. The point was not to reproduce Gringlish for Gringlish, Gralbanian for Gralbanian, right? That would just be another way of trying to say this is an invariant and I'm going to do the exact same thing in the language. But to borrow those translingual techniques about transliteration and homophy and use them as a kind of uh, motor, something that would get something going um, in, in my translations. OK, so let me just end quickly with a few of my experiments. Um, if a transliterative translation uh, focuses on visual poetics, the appearance of writing on the page, and the surprise of seeing a foreign word in a new form, a homophonic translation could put more emphasis on the oral tradition and how we hear things inter and interlingually. So um, a transliterative translation of Valtinos's uh, American migration tale could use spelling, punctuation, and eye dialects, dialects to, reveal the ten to reveal the tension between what looks or sounds similar in, similar in two or more different languages or registers. So I actually, I think I gave you this. This is the way I kind of, my homework. <laughs> I took a page of this uh, Valtinos novel and just tried to map out all the parts that were Gringlish and how they were kind of adding up to their own order and then the parts that were in Italian because Cordopatis goes to Italy before he gets to America. He's always getting set back from somewhere. Um, and so um, I, I wanted to see if I could use this to find a new way to make my translation visually hybrid, this mixing of languages. Um, instead of phonetically spelling uh, a foreign words and then adding definitions, as the existing translation does, with uh, frutoria, an Italian fruit shop, um, I tried to provide the sense of discovery that often accompanies translingualism through unconventional spelling that includes familiar English words such as fruit and grocery. So you can see I was trying to kind of put fruit, frutaria, you could kind of get it whether or not you knew the Italian, and grosseria, you could also kind of do that. So the idea would be that you could you know, have the pleasure of puzzling out the unknown words. A transliterative translation could also signal the relations between different creoles by inscribing foreign accents, bono for bono, and yes for yes. This sense of the foreign might be intensified through the repetition of sounds, the Italian O and the Greek S. So this is when he is finally arriving, and this also has the fruit idea. And um, my translation goes, not a word I understood. On the way, I see a fruit idea, see a light with a man inside who sees me. Italiano, he says. No, Greco, I say. Bono, Greco. Italiano, I ask. Yes, he says. Bono, Italiano, I say. Greek sala, some place to sleep, I add. My eyes well up. We don't understand each other. <laughs> so the challenge is to introduce foreign accents so that they can work persuasively in the translating language, establishing a different look and sound to destabilize the current standard dialect. Um, basically, there's another example I could give you about the homophony of um, Dimitrius. He, uh, with using rhyme and, and uh, repetition. But since I see my 20 minutes is almost up, more up, <laughs> let me just give you the last paragraph. Translism, translingualism invites us to think at the micro level about how to move within and between languages and cultures. If original compositions cross borders and share lexicons, syntactical structures, and reference, then surely translations can do this as well. To perceive and make sense of such translation practices, however, we must accept 
The translations are interpretations that maintain a resemblance to the source text, but simultaneously transform it. An ethical approach to translation that rests on this assumption involves not only making visible the minority status, status of minority languages and literatures so as to alter our expectations of what is possible in translation, but also acknowledging what we already share, the unexpected collaborations between languages and cultures that transliteration and homophony make possible. Thank you very much, and I think what we can do is when we're all discussing, maybe if there's an example you passed over, we can you know, later on come back to it. So I'd like to pass uh, the baton on to Thank you. Shall we go? Is this okay? Okay. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Karen. Um, I still remember our discussion in Paris last year. It was about, yeah, a few months ago. Deja vu. And uh, I remember we uh, crossed on the coffee, lead to this, and now almost a year passed. Um, and I remember I was writing this novel, and then I finished. And uh, I asked you guys about linguistic side, and I asked Susan, can you introduce me some linguists for my novel? And anyway, so I'm really pleased. I finally finished this book. Um, so my, my stuff is very narrative, um, compared with Karen and uh, Kamas. I'm just a storyteller, so I'm going to just read a, a three little section from this new novel, which is going to come out in June. And I thanked all you on my thank list for this novel. Without you, I don't know. There's no such a novel. Um, so it's called Just Cause, this novel. And it's, of, of course, you, very familiar for you because if you know, yeah. So it's after Laura Barter's uh, original book, which is non-fiction, A Lover's Just Cause Fragments. But my idea is to create two characters. They're the embodiment of the the... the the immigration and language confusion and the, the difficulty of com communicate rather than, I think, in Roland Barthes' book, is more psychological analysis um, behind the lover's uh, discourse. Uh, yet, um, I guess, you know, the, the, the language, the, the migration issue is not his first concern. And I think me, I'm from China, so the storytelling um, served that purpose for, for this number. So, so this is just a little section, as if um, I'm just telling you the two characters in a very simple, in a reductionist way, just uh, yeah, just keep going for, for this uh, dialogue. So this novel is led by by vocabulary and dialogues, and man and woman doesn't have, they don't have a name. By the way, I'm speaking my second language, so you already tell. <laughs> so this section called Engelander, and it's a German word. Are you English? I asked. So she is a Chinese woman, kind of monolingual person, but adopted second language in English. And he is an Australian, German, British person who doesn't have this kind of multi, um, well, he doesn't suffer from identity problems for some reason. <laughs> so, so she said, are you English? For me, this fact needed to be confirmed and checked. So I knew to whom I was speaking to. No way, I'm no pawn. You laughed. That's what we used to say in Australia. No poem? I was puzzled. My monoculture mono Chinese education was manifesting itself again. But what does that mean? Look, I am an Anglo-Saxon, a wasp. A wasp? <laughs> now it was my turn to laugh. You mean a fly with these yellow-black stripes going around staining people? <laughs> no, no, I don't stain people, but I do wear striped shirts. <laughs> you explained, a wasp is a white Anglo-Saxon protester. You might have heard of it? No, never in China. I shook my head. So, but where are you from then? I can't tell if you have an accent. Oh, I grew up in Australia, on the East Coast. When I was 18, we moved to Germany. Just to cut a long story short, one morning, my father woke up and announced that he wanted to go back to Germany. Then you put on a German accent. I can't. I can do a German accent if I want to. But my Mutter is ein Engländer. That's me <laughs> summed up. Mutter, Mutter, mother, I guessed. The rest remain opaque. I could see that Australia, Germany, and England all had something to do with what you were. And there was something mysterious 
attractive about him. So another section, the title is Hai Wu Ji Wu. It means if you love your mansion, you will love the magpie too. So it's an old Chinese idiom, Hai Wu Ji Wu. So she, the character, now is sitting on a sofa reading some German books. And her flatmate, who's Italian, asked, Are you going to Berlin soon? Oh, no, no, no. I, I just met a German, actually a half German, I explained. She giggled and asked, And the other half is? Uh, Australian, I answered. I know, opposing characters like Yin and Yang. Ha, ah, so you prefer reading books about Germany rather than Australia? Yes, perhaps I thought. But what do, I do, what do I know about either of these cultures? You know, in Chinese we say, I would you. It means if you love your mansion, and you will love the magpie too. Why? What's the connection between mansion and the magpie? She asked. Well, in Chinese, mansion and magpie have the same pronunciation, wu. Oh, God. She looked at me as if I had grown three heads. <laughs> then she yawned and walked away, carrying her swing sixty books. So on my bed later on that evening, in my pajamas, I looked at internet images of those ice age lakes in and around Berlin, and their strange German names, Schlachtensee, Wannsee, Magersee, Protzensee. So they call their lake Z, S-E-E, -E, rather than S-E-A. And they call their sea, Mir, M-E-E-R. Curiously non-English, I thought. And of course, this was obvious. German is different from English, but still, I realized I was encountering a third language. And that was very different from learning English, because English was always in the atmosphere, like pollen from plants permeating the air, whereas German was like a specific mountain in the landscape, which you had to have a particular ambition to climb. <laughs> and then the last section, uh, du monde, German word, moon in English. So the next time I met you, I asked many questions about your Germanness. Or rather, I interpreted you and even accused you of being Germanic. I found the German culture confusing. So tell me, please, in every culture, yeah, moon, is feminine in Chinese too. So why is the moon masculine in your German? Do you really see the moon as a male character? So we were just in this Turkish cafe near Dalston, East London. Everyone around us were eating brown mushy chickpeas. <laughs> People in East London seem to eat a lot of chickpeas. <laughs> oh, why is moon masculine in German? You repeated my question. As if you sensed that this was not a simple linguistic question. You thought about it for a few seconds, then you answered, Well, demand. In some other languages, like Sanskrit, the moon is masculine and the sun feminine. I remember learning in school about some pre-Babylonian Sumerian languages. The word for moon is explicitly um, masculine, as it is in Arabic. The word for sun is feminine, you said. Really? So you think it's just a different tradition that we see the moon as female? I said. Yes, there's nothing objective about how you feel about stars or planets. It's all literature. It's all literature? Yeah. I thought about what you said for a while. Perhaps I was just one of those romantic and cultural preservationists who view things according to convention or according to the cliches of literature, as you pointed out. But still, I continued. But if the stool, the chair, is masculine, then why is the table not feminine? I thought the chair and the table make a perfect match. <laughs> God, no, there's no logical explanation, please. There's no why. You just can't ask a question like that about language. So your no eyes were looking for something that you pointed to my cutlery, and you said, for example, you have the gabel, the fork, the loffel, the spoon, and das messer, 
and knife. A fork is feminine, a spoon masculine, a knife is neutral. Why? No reason. Just convention. So the only way to learn the genders of nouns is just to treat their articles as a complement of the word. Oh God, that's so very unnatural for Chinese people. In our language, we don't have articles. <laughs> Why, you don't have any articles? No, why bother? <laughs> we save time for something else. <laughs> something else? Like what, though? Well, like enjoying the taste of green tea, or staring into a pond, or look at the frogs, and checking out the lotus flowers, or looking at dragonflies. So that's one of the three sections. <laughs> which no one from the audience can understand. Uh, I wanted to focus on the language itself as music. Years ago, I got this beautiful book, uh, The Diwan, or The Book of Poetry, of, of Bar Hebreus, Gregorius Bar Hebreus, uh, who is a Syrian, Syriac poet who spoke Persian, Armenian, Syriac, and Arabic. I translated the text with difficulties and did a transliteration for the text. You can see the line, the, the first line is Arabic, and down is a translation to Arabic. After tra translation, the text, translating the text to Arabic and doing the transliteration, I had to translate the whole text to Polish because the chorus which is going to sing the piece is a Polish chorus. It's the uh, Polish radio chorus and Polish radio large symphony orchestra. Which was it, it was it was difficult to translate something. And the the, the goal, uh, how to make it possible for a Polish chorus to sing Aramaic or Neo Aramaic, which is Syriac. Uh, the proper or the academic way maybe is to use the international phonetic alphabet. And I had a friend who is a singer in this course, a very good soprano, and I wrote her a few things to read, just to check if she is able to read it, and can I put it in the score of music, especially in our days where you have two rehearsals and a concert, or even one rehearsal and a concert. So the result was, the first she said this is wa, and the second she said it za, and the third, uh, la, mm. and the last, fa. So, it, it's all wrong, actually. <laughs> yeah, this, the first is sha, the second, ja, then la, then sha, then tha. This is an example also about one word, ayn, ayn, which is i or the letter ayn. And you can see uh, out written in the international phonetic alphabet, and you can see it written like we do it for every day, out. The same with the letter ha, this is how it's supposed to be, harf means a letter, and you have harf and harf. I lived in Poland for a long time, and uh, a lot of people asked me, how to say hi in your language? I say marhaba, and they say marhaba. No, marhaba. So it's impossible. 
Those letters are impossible to pronounce by Polish people. Ain, ha, ha, gain, ta, ta, ain, kaf, ha. The strategy with Ain, it's Ain, Ain, kaf, q, ha, kh, ta, th. It's, 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 it's very simple and very, you know, straight. Ta, ta, gain, gain. Ha and Ha H. I ask a native speaker to read the whole thing for me so I can share it with the chorus singers and the conductor. So that this is the best strategy. So they can listen and listen and listen and try. Hmm. Let's listen to him. Oops, sorry. I did a mistake. There's no song. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's written, Hu Bo Sharbin Shafir Sharbuk. Not that. Hu Bo Shafio. Ha. Ha. Hu Bo. Let's listen to the chorus. Sing Hu Bo. so they can know what they are talking about, what they are singing. I will play the last verse, which is, I, I did a fast translate to, to uh, sorry, English is not my first, or it's my third language. So we have the Arabic, the transliteration, and the Polish and the English. I will play it for you to listen to the result. I want to say something here in music. If you have a good conductor, who can really articulate few things. You hear the music in the language and you don't really need to know what it's all about. Hmm. I will, uh, let's, Admin Aikoro, Dalo Huthu, Shwahle Firo. And I asked the conductor to articulate Shwahle. And we have the female voices singing in different places and you hear shwa, 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 hle, shwa, hle, hear it from different places. Yeah. You see that even a native speaker has difficulty with the language. I mean, it's it's shame because uh, a lot of Syrian people left Syria. Uh, during the First World War and then from 1980s to Sweden, Germany, to the United States. And my young uh, friends who are Syriac, they don't know the language. They only can speak, say a few words. And uh, only people who sing in the church, they know the language. Mm -hmm. But they don't feel really comfortable with it. I mean, uh, this is all about uh, Arab nationalism in Syria and all the countries and you know it's, it's, it's happening to the Kurdish people as well. Uh, I did a focus here on the score where you see I can't show the whole score, it's big, we have wind instruments, strings and percussion. I will play it for you, the, just the last part of the piece to focus on
that just got started um, toward the end of our time there. Oh yeah, I have tech. Um, so, in putting together my remarks for today, which are going back, I think, hopefully, to kind of close a loop that was opened by, uh, by Karen, um, my point of departure was really writer and translator John Keane's call for more substantive reflections on race across diverse cultural frameworks. So, in some ways, migration is going to figure into my story or my conversation as well. Oh, yeah, I do want to put it. I'm not seeing every window I have open on my computer. <laughs> All right. Um, so Keane argues in a beautifully written essay titled Translating Poetry, Translating Blackness, that to translate, quote, blackness in its various iterations and geocultural contexts might do some work to make plain the contingency and the specificity of race as a lived experience, and further, might serve to push, again, push against what have become homogenizing, really US-centric conceptions of what blackness represents. And so it's with this in mind that I want to consider the geocultural site symbol, a term I think of as describing Haiti, which is a place whose blackness continues to be seen as uniquely pathological in many ways. Because it does have to be said, Haiti is black in a special kind of way. Yes, it's as foundationally aphrodisphoric as its other Caribbean neighbors, but it's long been disparaged by the particular racialized denigration of its popular religion. More specifically, the idiosyncrasy of Haiti's blackness has everything to do with degrading perceptions and representations of voodoo. The negative perception of voodoo in the global north amounts to a deployment of culture to euphemize the idea of race. North Atlantic discourse about Haiti consistently cast the country as fundamentally stunted by its Afro-spiritual practices. And insofar as theories of cultural difference equate more or less transparently with theories of race, the stigmatizing of voodoo as cultural practice is unequivocally racial. So translating this voodoo nation or this voodoo nation into the wider world was very much for me a matter of ethics and, more obliquely, a matter of politics. And I hope to explain what I mean by that in this conversation. So Haiti presents what I see as a high-stakes example of blackness in need of translation. And translating this novel, Adriana de Tomei Rev, Adriana in All My Dreams, was in this respect something of a destigmatizing effort on my part, an effort to place an alternative narrative of Haitian voodoo into circulation in the global north. Following Keen, I've understood translating Haitian literature more broadly from French into English as a means, however modest, of creating space for an expanded notion of blackness within the African diaspora. Of course, post-colonial writers like Bonnie de Pestre, author of Ariane en Tumé Rêve, are already called on to do the work of translation, that is, to translate their foreignness for institutions, industries, and consumers who are situated primarily in the global north. And doing so can, of course, be very tricky. Whatever an author's purpose or desire, a text can so easily be co-opted as an exotic good, which presents something of a bind. How do you represent, say, island culture without sensationalizing it, reifying existing racial stereotypes, or censoring its idiosyncrasies in the interest of rendering it more palatable to a world that denies its values? How do you present non-Western culture to the West for consumption without betraying that culture in the process? Because there's a very fine line, of course, between opening a window onto an othered culture and playing to stereotypes for commercial gain. And so this is arguably a line that de Pestre might be said to walk in Adriana, which is essentially the story of a pretty French girl who gets turned into a zombie. <laughs> now, de Pestre certainly doesn't shy away from representing the pathologies of Haitian voodoo. 
he incorporates the unsavory dimensions of Haiti's religious practices, and he invites an interrogation of Odu's ambivalence around matters of race and gender. By including over-the-top elements like evil black magic sorcerers, a sex-crazed human butterfly, and yes, zombies, he does risk affirming Western stereotypes about Afro-diasporic religion. But by the same token, de Pestre takes care, I would argue, and have argued in scholarly context. He takes care also to portray the intricacies of Odu as epistemology, aesthetic, and true faith. So how does my translation fit into all of this? Well, if de Pestre's novel offered a translation of Afro-Haitian culture to a non-Haitian Francophone audience in the late 1980s when it was first published, leaning, as it did, right into the world of complexities surrounding the global image of Haitian Vodou, my translation of Antoniana proposed carrying both Haiti's culture and its languages across to a new target reading public 30 years later. As an Afro-American woman of Caribbean descent, I kept front of mind three very specific engagements when I took on this task of the translator. First, translating responsibly within the current maelstrom of narratives about Haiti, Vodou, and blackness more broadly. Second, translating to and for a particular Afro-diasporic readership. And then third, remaining very attentive to the packaging of my translation. So obviously, the translator, or maybe not so obviously, but obvious to me, the translator of Haitian literature must always be thinking hard about the politics of translating and the violence that translation can do. If successful, the translated work of post-colonial post -colonial black writers contributes to articulating the diversity of black experiences on a global scale. But if not, if not successful, there could be more and less direct consequences regarding global policies for peoples and so-called black nations. Failures of cultural translation create hierarchies of value where in lesser shithole countries are misread as lacking or deficient, often deemed unworthy of protection from harm. The case of Haiti is a stark instance of ways in which translation informs our understandings of which black lives matter and which don't. The power differential between Haiti and countries like the US that have been so implicated in Haiti's social, political, and artistic institutions makes the question of translation less one of inequality between languages and more one of inequality between cultures. And the most pernicious and obvious basis for the hierarchical diminishing of Haiti hinges on the matter of race. Exceptional and absolute, Haiti's blackness, again a blackness that's fundamentally linked to Vodou, marks its every iteration or every inter interaction with the world beyond its borders. As Stuart Hall rightly argues, it's crucial not only to identify ways in which, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, ways in which economic structures are relevant to racial divisions, but also to consider how the two, the economic and the racial, are theoretically connected. The first task is to attend specific racialized social formations, what Hall names, quote, this something else that translates backward and forward between the social, racial, and the economic. I'm arguing that Vodou is an instance of this something else Hall names. It's an ostensibly extra economic factor that to a large extent determines Haiti's legibility to the outside world. But it was a cipher through which much of the nation's political and economic struggles have been read, especially in the United States. Vodou has been aggressively fashioned and thus widely perceived as an obstacle to Haiti's development. From aid organizations to the news media to the Hollywood film industry, Haitian Vodou, or Voodoo, double O, double O, in the US American quote translation, is consistently deployed to signal Haiti's perceived backwardness dysfunction. And ever since the word voodoo, double O, double O, came into wide use in an English lexicon, this label has served to disparage Haitians. It's been used to evoke evil, brutality, sexual excess, and depravity. And it's a significant purchase in U.S. mediatizations of Haiti's supposed ungovernability and propensity for disaster. So the translation of Haitian voodoo, B-O-D-O-U, into voodoo, B-double-O, D-double-O, -O, in English, has been a highly politicized matter for the past several decades. Since 2011, Haitian and Haitianist scholars and practitioners of voodoo have petitioned various prominent media institutions to dissociate the term voodoo from Haitian spiritual practices by adjusting their style sheets. And this effort has largely been met with indifference. And to be clear, voodoo, B-O-D-O-U, describes a spiritual practice of faith or religion in Haiti. Voodoo was invented, invented in the 1930s by U.S. Marines, essentially, to describe black magic, sorcerers, those dolls we see, right, zombies and all of this. And insensit insensitivity to the negative force of double O double O voodoo has very much been an issue in the domain of literary translation as well. The 2015 publication of Haitian novelist Kathleen Mouse's Saison Sauvage, Savage Seasons in English is a troubling example of this phenomenon. The novel's, the novel's talented and very much decorated translator, Jean Herman, made and has since defended the decision to render voodoo as voodoo in the English text. When asked in uh, an article, and in a 
uh, published interview, Herman explained that after thinking, quote, long and hard about voodoo versus voodoo, end quote, she and her editor, quote, finally decided voodoo seemed more accessible. Herman went on to say, quote, I thought voodoo priestess had a nice ring to it, something almost Baudelairean about it. So the insouciance of Herman's rationalization at best suggests an unawareness of the real stakes of this choice. At worst, her position echoes a long history of cultural and racial condescension and North American supremacy. Now granted, Herman readily acknowledged that she had little to no familiar familiarity with Haiti or its cultural and political realities prior to translating this novel. But I would argue that this is distressing in and of itself. Her admitted absence of cultural sensitivity due to lack of information about the source context is ultimately a function of the US publisher's relative unconcern with the fact of Haiti's precarity on the world stage. The careless claim that the term voodoo is currently most accessible begs two critical questions. One, what Anglophone audience is the novel meant to interpret? And two, what pedagogic and ethical responsibility do the translator and the publisher bear? These questions bring me to my second of three points of entanglement in approaching the translation of Hester's novel, the matter of audience. Haiti is arguably as foreign to non-Haitian Afro-diasporic communities in the US and elsewhere as it is to Europeans and non-Black Americans. So although largely marginalized as second-class citizens within their national context, Afro-diasporic consumers of first world media have necessarily been influenced by anti-Haitian stereotypes of voodoo. U.S. American blacks especially are situated by virtue of their nationality on the privileged side of the developed, underdeveloped, imperialist, colonized divide. And this means that they don't necessarily recognize Haitians as political and cultural kin. So in other words, Afro-diasporic populations in the Anglophone Caribbean and in the U.S. have also tended to see Haitians as less than. Though geographically proximate and ostensibly racially allied with Haitians, Afro-Anglophone communities throughout the Americas have remained in many ways distanced from the so-called black republic. And so I had this fact very much in mind as part of the process of translating to Festo's novel, a novel I was essentially turning into a commodity for consumption in the English-speaking world. And this motivated me to be very lucid regarding my intention and my responsibility both to the source text and to the source culture. Vodou was necessarily a potentially problematic factor in this regard. So my choice of the word vodou in the English itself marked a definitive stance vis-a-vis -vis the ethics of representing Haiti in foreign spaces. But even beyond that decision, the novel posed the challenge of representing voodoo culture in translation. I knew full well that Pestra's unabashed incorporation of, quote, local color, in Adriana, might allow certain readers, including black American and non-Haitian Caribbean readers, to find a home for their pre-existing judgment, for their prejudice. But still, I had to resist overstepping my authority as the translator and somehow sanitizing De Pestra's novel in deference to the relatively Puritan culture of the Anglosphere. Adriana contains several highly erotic scenes, including descriptions of sexual encounters between Adriana and various male and female partners, and also with the aforementioned butterfly, as well as indications of the explicit sensuality and sexuality of voodoo. So for the most part, I tried to follow the source text lead. I did my best to identify English terms that would render the extravagance of the Pestro's preathically comic register around sexuality, and the result is that now, in you know, far too many ways of describing male and female genitalia in English. <laughs> But these things were very much overblown by the French publisher's description and depiction of a half-naked woman on the book jacket cover. So this is the cover that was produced by Gallimard in the original French edition. Mm -hmm. And this is what brings me to the last of the three factors that preoccupied me as I translated Adriana. So one, beyond the, the lexical decision making around the word Vodou, and beyond, secondly, the question of the interests and the capacities of my personally aspired to audience, my other interventions as translator had to do with the literal packaging of De Pestra's novel for the Anglophone world. I had to find a publisher I could trust to do justice to the novel's deep anchoring in Haitian culture without betraying that culture by pandering to the potentially racist presumptions of the non-Haitian reading public. What I'm saying basically is that I didn't want to spend any time fighting the voodoo voodoo fight with any press or fending off marketers keen on putting zombies on the cover of, of the book. So I spent um, over two very frustrating years shopping this translation. I began optimistically by approaching an imprint of a major international press that had recently published a Haitian novel in translation and done what I thought was a good job. And the response was disappointing but encouraging. The editors had nothing to, but good things to say about the translation, but they thought the generic instability of the novel made it more suitable, suitable quote, for an independent press. And I have to say, it's a novel that has like, part of it is an anthropological treatise, there's a letter, there's a newspaper article. It's a bizarre 
piece of work, but okay, not for public consumption apparently. Undaunted, I nevertheless then approached with editors of two independent presses, both of whom found the book, and quoting from the emails I got, quote, fascinating, but too challenging for a casual reader. The novel definitely was an African American fiction, one told me, so okay. And its presentation of a white heroine on a black island was thorny. What was the, quote, publishing hook, one of them asked me. And they suggested then that I reach out to an academic press. All right. Still, still, unbelievably undaunted, I did just that. But this option also came to, um, to naught. Because even with my proposed critical introduction, Tatch, and, and strong praise for the quality of the translation from the readers, Adriana's presentation of the exotic and the erotic made the editor nervous about reception among the press's academic readership. There's in something of a mind here with this thing. And by now, I was thoroughly daunted. But frankly, I really, I, just, I didn't understand how it was possible that this novel, written by an author who was admired by major contemporary Haitian literary figures and Caribbean literary figures, had won several major prizes, including the prestigious Prix Bonodeau in France when it came out in 1988, and had been translated, I should point out, into seven other languages, right? So Polish, Czechoslovakian, Czechoslovakian Italian, uh, Japanese, right? But not English. I didn't understand how it could be of so little interest, so little purchase in an Anglophone market. And so I played my last card. I reached out to Edmi Chidantiat, darling of everybody. <laughs> and I asked Edmi whether she'd consider writing a foreword to the translation. And her response, quote, whatever you need, my dear, I really love that book. Oh. That response set me back on track. It made me realize that I wasn't crazy in the project I was trying to do, that um, that there was something valuable in a text that I come to think, well, maybe I'm just wrong about this book, which would be devastating also because I was writing about it in like my forthcoming scholarly book. <laughs> but in any event, her response sent me back on track. Because when it comes to so-called marginal literature, the right preface can really make all the difference. As Richard Rock Watts has written, a preface can serve both to quote, move the merchandise and to signal to the reader the quality, seriousness, and perhaps even the liberal orientation of the text in question, end quote. So famously respected and even beloved by both Haitians and non-Haitians, by both scholars and Oprah Winfrey, Edvige Dantica was the ideal shepherd for Adriana in the Afro-Anglosphere. Her own work is renowned and much celebrated for its sensitive treatment of gender and transnational blackness, and so I knew she'd be perfectly placed to kind of vouch for the legitimacy of Depestra's intent and his accomplishment. And the elegant preface that Dantica ended up providing does just that. It contextualizes, educates, and reassures. It highlights Adriana's at once universal and insular scope, its invitations and its refusals. It offers guidance without preachiness, explanation without condescension. Her foreword is, in and of itself, a very graceful instance of translation. So with Edvige's paratextual and primitive secured, I went on to pitch the project with renewed confidence. I was back to being undaunted. My target this time was Akashic Books, a well-reputed and widely admired small publishing house, whose catalog counts multiple titles related to race in the US American frame, as well as a wide ranging and extensive list of important titles by living Caribbean writers. So the presence on their list of celebrated living Afro-diasporic authors, several of whom write their islands from the vantage point of the continental US, that did the work of vetting the press for me to a certain extent, of assuring me that Adriana would be handled with care. Akashic's carefulness in fashioning the post-colonial package of my translation shows in the details of the frame the publisher put around the published manuscript. Most importantly, from a commercial perspective, in the cover art, the paratextual element most viscerally responsible for interpolating potential readers. For Adriana's cover, Akashi proposed to my great pleasure and relief an, Im an image both evocative and respectful of Haitian Vodou, and as such, of Haitian blackness. I can explain what's going on here. What you can see in the background of this text, the sort of symbols um, that are in, that are faded out for the most part, aside from the symbol at the top, which is a, um, a particularly important symbol. <clears throat> a particularly important symbol. Um, these are stylizations of Haitian vivi. And vivi are very powerful religious symbols that are used during Vodri ceremonies to call the spirits into attendance. They're traced on the floor of the ritual space using a mixture of cornmeal and, and ash. And so what the artist did here was 
use the vivid to form the pattern of the muted background and, and then also integrate them into the typeface of the book's title, presenting an opacity that's both an invitation and a refusal. If you know Vodou, you recognize those symbols at once. If you are from the Caribbean or from Haiti, this book is something for you. And I should say that one of my audiences are Haitians who exist in diaspora and who no longer have any um, context to, in which to read French that are either Creolophone or Anglophone that don't read French, right? But who will recognize these vivid? And if you are uninitiated, there are beautiful designs but that in no way betrays or perverts sort of the American understandings of the double O, D, double O. So to me, this cover really embodies the risks that are inherent in extracting Haiti's blackness from its original Francophone context and presenting it, carrying it over cautiously, mediated and repackaged into an English speaking world. So thank you for coming. Also, thank you for um, everybody for keeping within the time limit we agreed on because now we have time for a really nice discussion and I think a lot of food for thought was presented. So first I would like to ask who, if any of you or who of you would like to ask each other questions or comments. This is a kind of an open, open call. I have my own questions and thoughts that I'll bring up later. But would you like to... <laughs> um, and the first one is it's really for, for Karen, but I think the others are, or are more broad and more just, the other question is more of a thought question. Um, so for Karen, there's just one moment, I'm not sure when it was in your talk that inspired me to ask this, but I think it's a, you talked about how the translator can seek homophony, right, as being the goal of the, of the new product that we, we produce. And, and it made me think, so is, is the goal in the instances, let's say, that you're talking about to speak Greek in English? Like, is that a way we could, no, wait a minute, yeah, just to speak Greek in English. Um, and then, kind of more specifically, and this leads into my second question, like how can we tell then, would you argue, the difference between a translation that's intentionally doing this, speaking the source language in the target language, and a, ten, and a translation that is actually missing the mark or, or failing. Um, because the work that you're doing is the work of a scholar, right? You're pointing us to the ways in which we can detect um, le, le the, the work of the translator. But when we're talking about the product that's out there in the world, picked up off the shelf by someone who wants to read the text, who may not have access to that level of, um, of insight, what does it mean in that case? And I think that the broader question for, for the three of us, three of you, four of us, is, how to tell when a translation is failing or succeeding, and who takes the blame? You know, like is it the source or is it the translator? Something. Well, so that's a really, really great question, and I think that we're all thinking about it. I mean, I thought about this a lot with the uh, Sholu and I are teaching a course on comparative diasporas and translation, and we've had some projects where we're trying to translate English into Greek and her Chinese English into Greek, and have been really thinking about. This and my, my first response to you is no, it's not about. I mean, I use a kind of as a beginning place something like what uh, Olga Brumas is doing, which very much is thinking about how these vowels could be used. But but she doesn't, nobody who reads her poems even knows that she's Greek. No, no, I mean, if you go to the library and look at encyclopedias, she's a lesbian poet in the tradition of Adrian Rich and, mm. and Sexton, and nobody talks about that. So that's not, you know, that's not what's going on. But it, it does make you understand that it's a kind of, it's a, it's a you know, like all of these techniques we have in, in poems and in literature, these are, it's a formal thing. So when I'm saying using homophony, right, or transliteration, I'm saying these are texts that seem to be so structured by them and, and, and it's so generative for um, making us understand the struggle, transliteration being something that keeps on stopping us, right? And homophony is something that can create a homophon, something that makes us feel like we're communicating even if we don't know. That these were so constructed in the text that I thought, okay, I'm not going to take Greek or Gralbanian or Gringlish, but I'm going to see how I can make those strategies, right? A visual um, uh, tension uh, and uh, oral, uh, you know, harmony or whatever, be 
use them as, as strategies in writing. So that's more what I'm thinking. So it was the valiness, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I, you know, one of the things that we had that comes back to what Shou Lu did is that there was a section of uh, of the Chinese, um, the concise Chinese English dictionary for lovers, which was kind of the first version of what we got to hear tonight, right? And uh, it, I had turned it into a poem, and in my Greek translator of this series of what I call lifted poems, which takes prose and makes them into, you can't really change them much, but anyway, we, we, you can just sort of put a title in. And so bringing it, and the Greek translator was really, really great because she said, well, listen, in Greek, um, this problem with not having uh, an article that is kind of a problem in English is a huge problem in Greek because it just and so it sounded almost like a caricature because it was just it sounded so much more broken, and I said, great, you know, go for it because what she was using was that strategy to push and up the ante and do something right. So I guess the answer to your question is that thing I'm trying to say about selectivity, that bad poetry or bad, I mean, no, because I had a whole chapter in this book that was just called Bad Poetry because I was a Greek-American. It, it was just like endlessly bad stuff that would arrive on my office door, you know, these boxes of bad, bad books. But what I decided is leave that out, forget that, and really think, I mean, it's an interesting social question, right? Yeah. But actually think about what some of these texts that are broken language, but convince us, get us on board for their project, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that, that, yes, that, yeah, that, 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 can I show yeah, yeah. um, This is a wonderful question, um, Kaima, because I think we're co-teaching this course, I learned so much, um, I think both on the narrative layer and the, the, the translation theory, which normally a writer, a, a storyteller doesn't think about the, 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 you know, the, 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 the actual, the practicality of the translation process. And you made me think. And also, when Larry came in last time to, to our students, I think it's wonderful. The, the idea is, is not about <laughs> during translations loss or gain. This is an ancient question. And, and then the question goes to how, do, how a translator, do, does he dom or she domesticate to the text, a foreign text, or, or she or he sends the readers to abroad through that foreign text? And I think it's all, it's even beyond those questions. Is, when we're dealing with a narrative text, especially, um, where the, I think the translator's political choice is so profound, and uh, because the invisible is so profoundly actually abound there, you know, what, exactly like Haima, you mentioned the Udo thing, the, because I don't have the knowledge of, of, of that the area, but I, I realize that is a place the translator put, the political identity and how he suggests what kind of tradition or say the new tradition he should put forward for the foreign readers is so important. And I think for me, I learned, um, I think a, a sleeping text, uh, uh, when you say the bad text, it's, it's a text that doesn't provoke a foreign readers or native readers to, to think of the other culture. So there's no feeling of the otherness and it's a laziness of the disappearing of the otherness. And I think that's a very politically incorrect right. the role as a translation. And I guess my kind of writers, or, or Zaid, we are doing is to suggest this, this alienness, the foreignness, somehow in a poetic way or in a story narrative way to wake you up, to, to accept our foreignness. And therefore, you are more knowledgeable through this alienness, which are the, the translator, you, you, Honorable, be, you know, human beings are doing all your work every day. Such a tough um, task. So I would like to ask. Are you gonna are you gonna answer the questions? Are you going to ask me? <laughs> well, uh, do you want to answer this last question, or I have another one that's that's for you in particular? Yes. Also. Well, I, I, I just wanted to talk about provocation about uh, uh, the the idea about using the Syriac language or one of the near Aramaic languages is to focus on a minority which is disappearing from Syria. And to focus on a language which is very beautiful, the poetry of Gregorius Bar Hebraeus in 13th century written, which is, you know, uh, no one really cares about it. I had to find the book uh, 
from someone who brought it from Holland to find something about him because it's very hard to find even in Arabic translation. I wanted to focus on people which we don't know and they are very interesting. And to focus on a language which has completely different sound and using so-called dead language, it's not dead, but uh, it's always fresh because the languages which we really speak, we hear every day in the radio, in the television, in the pop songs, we abuse the language. And I wanted to escape to a language which we don't know, just to focus on the music of the language and use it in this piece. So that was the answer to the question I was going to ask, which was when you said you wanted to write in a language that nobody in the audience would understand, I wanted to ask why. So you've, you've, you've answered at least part of that question. But I was, I was thinking one of the, some of the themes that came out in all of these talks um, that are things like comprehensibility and intelligibility, which are not the same thing. You know, to choose a language that no one can understand, unless even the singers, you had to give them both a translation and then even the transliteration in the conventional mode would be unintelligible and not renderable, not reproducible. Um, another thing that I thought was an interesting theme here was the role of translation as both a form of mediation that, you know, in which the translator is an agent, but also a form of filtering. In, in all of your cases, there was a kind of a filtering going on where some of the things are captured in the filter and some of the things pass through the filter. Um, none of you, I don't think, use the word language barrier, but of course, in some sense, you're all dealing with the concept of a language, language as a barrier. So not a filter, not a mediation, but as a barrier, something that's standing between. Um, and also, the oral and the written was very important in, in all of these, the distinction between how something sounds, how something is written, but also in the case of um, Zaid's music, the fact that something which is written, in some sense, is no longer oral. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that it's a matter of somebody being illiterate, it's that you're, you're dealing with something that's almost a disappearing orality. And then the visual and the oral, so the visual trace, whether it's the different um, alphabets or characters, or even as you were showing us the visual trace you know of the arabic in relation to the phonetic alphabet in relation to music the score um that whole uh, inscription the whole role of inscription you know we have we tend to have a way of talking about language and inscription which is very kind of post-structuralist but it's very reductive and it doesn't take into account all of these extremely important issues that are much more complicated than a kind of a, uh, a French theory way of looking at language versus you know, the utterance and, and the written. And I think closing with the design of the, um, the book cover is a very good way of thinking about that relationship between sort of the, un, the unwritten understanding, a kind of a culturally, you know, a culturally interiorized understanding, and then this visual, nonverbal visual inscription, which then has a, a very specific meaning. So it's even beyond like iconography, it's actually more meaningful than that, it even has almost a linguistic resonance because it relates back to that difference between if you are on the inside of this culture, you would use one spelling, Urdu, and then if you are sort of uh, distanced from it and in certain ways unsympathetic or uninformed, then you would use voodoo. So there's a correlation there, I think, between the way you describe the imagery you know, and the orthography. So I feel like there are a lot of issues that have come out of these four talks that are related, and so now I'm gonna ask for more, more commentary. I just, uh, can I say, and this is definitely a hot take, so I'm not, I haven't fully thought it through, except that when you said language barrier that none of us can use it, I don't know if the reasoning is the same for all of us, but I, I, I don't think I think of language barrier when I think of translation. I don't think, uh, I think of the space between languages as, as a, an obstacle, but insofar as borders and frontiers are, are arbitrary and you know, not limited except by what we imagine them to be. I don't think I've ever thought that there's a barrier between English, French, and Kayo, but rather to points of permeability that are waiting to be excavated and played with. And, and I came very organically to translation. Someone asked me to translate something I was writing about as a scholar, and for me it was a granting of permission to play with the text more than at any point it felt like an obstacle to I gotta make sure this is this, and this is hard or scary, but rather this is, wow, an 
opening and exploration of a space between languages that already existed and just needed to be uh, brought out. I meant something a little different because you had access to the language, but I was thinking of the example in Karen's text where they just couldn't understand each other. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant. Or, or is I choosing the text where indeed the original text was incomprehensible unless he rendered it, unless he, he transcended that kind of incomprehensibility. That's what I meant by the language barrier. Mm -hmm. There are cases in which there is there is something, people can sense something non-verbally, they right. can communicate non-verbally. Right. But, but, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. but yeah, exactly, and we didn't, we didn't yeah. think of it as a, a barrier. Because yeah. I, I was struck when uh, Zaid said um, that you know a conductor uh, can actually make you understand the music without understanding the language. And I think that's a lot of one of the lessons that I've learned from some of these questions of hom homophony in the Balkans, where people think that they are, I mean, they are, they're saying the same things and words, even though they're different languages and they mean different things. But just that soundscape, that physical space in which different people with different ideas are inhabiting that as something that is common. Mm -hmm. Or even if they don't know it's common, I mean, right, but somehow that really hit me as something that we do experience in music, of, of, and that, and I guess so. That's I would also say that it doesn't. It, it, I mean, I think that in order to be something so masochistic as a translator, <laughs> that that you have to feel like it's really fun, mm -hmm. and it's really, and it's, and that you're going to be able to explore. I mean, my my question for for you, Khan, was like because I love the example that you give of the the vodou and the voodoo, but I wanted to know, so as a kind of, and the way you talk about the, the Ford by Dantegat, but that interpretation which you gave us, how is it rendered? What do you do in the language of this text? I mean, it's, it, to, to make that happen. What's your selection? You know, that's really- I, mean, I can't hear because we didn't have the space right. to, I can, you know, there so are ways in this text that if, we were looking, I mean, I could do that, but it would, that is a process and that's part of it, right? So I did the sort of paratextual and the contextual, but there is the dirty, nitty gritty work of the textual that has to happen, and that does happen, um, especially when it comes to, um, and uh, this is very specific to this novel, but the use of kayon that has in it a very corporeal and um, physical, arguably erotic and sexual charge to it, how I played with that language in order to infuse English with something that I hope um, rendered the French without being salacious, um, but brought the comedic and the sexual together. So, yeah, I mean, there are examples of the text. Right, or, or, or maybe intertext that you used in also. English that, that would give you the license, because I think, you know, to do that, yeah. Thank you. I wish I'd been here at the first conversation because I just love what you were doing tonight. And it's had the third for me. Please come back. I just have so many questions. Um, but I think I'll just go with one. And it's something that has come up uh, in working on Southern Crossings with Zay. Um, we're using um, some uh, Griqua and Khoisan. And uh, we, we've been agonizing about a particular particular set of phrases uh, that, that, that a non-South African chorus is going to be required to sing. And part of the anxiety for us is that we, it, this, is, this opera is set at a time, it's the transition between slavery, between emancipation and full freedom, that four years apprenticeship that's, that slaves have to serve. serve. And the physicality of these words is an issue for us because if it is lost, something about that, uh, what what uh, Horton Spillers calls the, the in the flesh of, of slavery is lost. And and so we it, 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 something does disappear from tuika, right? If you can't do tuika, it's it's gone. Um, and, and yet, we have to rely on what the music is doing. And we're hoping that the music will save us if the non-South African audience is, is seeing that. And with those, the disappearances of what would be called cliques right, is, is also an embedded set of idiomatic flags. And with the idiomatic is local knowledge. 
and that for us is is an anxiety. Um, I I I do I go to opera. I don't understand every word. I just love it, right? So I, I'm I'm just I'm just trying to be a bit of a devil's advocate. I'm completely in agreement with what everybody's doing and saying. I'm quite fired up by it. But what about the fact? I, I remember Karen, you years ago set me on fire when you gave this beautiful lecture on idiom and idiomatic. The, the, it's the border, the outsider and the insider. Mm -hmm. with the, I wonder if you could talk about this because it is an anxiety. I think that it, what you just said, I mean, there's all sorts of ways that we know, right? that one can deal with this as a translator. Right. We have, you know, the translations of Tavir and, and Volkotsky or, or the translations of, of, of the Russian novels. We have um, the translators of Shamoiseau, you know, which have all these wonderful glossaries and, and, you know, so you can add in things to bring up the local, right? But I would say after kind of what I'm learning from these writers that I work, that work on the borders between and from teaching with Shalou that some of that local, what, what it, and this sounds like what's your issue too with the kind of erotic vocabulary of, of Creole, is that you just actually have to, that click that you made and the way you made us think about the flesh and the, there has to be a way to do that in a translation or in another language, right? It doesn't have to be the same. No. But I'm just thinking that clicks are interesting, right? You know, I'm thinking of, um, we're teaching uh, Susan Laurie Parks' plays, and they have these really weird things called spells in them, and rests. And they're, so they're just these, these structural things that you can do. And what I'm trying to understand, and I think it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is similar, is, is coming up with, it doesn't have to be the same, no. but it has to have a kind of multi sense it has to have that, port, that, that thing that happens when the visual is uh, playing off of it, or that you know, or the sound, right? So, and I certainly felt that in, in, in Zay talking about how he's moving between these different. I, I, I understand that, I really do, but um, I think also what I've been listening to all of you speak now is that it's also okay to hear something that you don't understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking of a moment uh, Louise Bennett during, I think just before World Wars, World War II, she's in England, whole group of other Jamaican uh, poets and writers and they're asked by BBC to come on on Christmas Eve and send a message to the Jamaican population in England and they all come with their perfect Queen's English and she comes up with patois and the shock of that was that suddenly people in the room heard, uh, the British heard English differently and the people in the room made the, the people who could speak in the room, conceptually, the people who, who understood the patois heard English differently in, in a different way. Um, I, I, I'm just I'm just throwing these things up because you just made my head spin. Thank you. <laughs> just add quickly one, one small thing, Yvette, is that also I heard just in terms of and thinking with Karen as well, that in my particular instance where I'm translating uh, mainly, except for more recently, been translating Haitian novels that were written in French into English. But I say that only to emphasize that the, the novelists themselves had already been doing an immense amount of work of translation. I only reference it quickly in, in this talk, but so I have often felt in translating Haitian fiction that I don't actually, the thing I want to honor is the work that they were trying to do in French. Um, and that I don't want to necessarily do more political, that much more political work than that original intention. And, but I want to find a way to do to a group of audience what a Haitian writer was trying to do to a Francophone audience. Right? And so it's a little bit of a once removed um, in the process of this. Please. Um, <coughs> thank you so much. Um, I'm new to this and I just wanted to give a context. I actually work on audiovisual translation, specifically dubbing in cinema. And um, I've actually had, so I'm an anthropologist who's have now entered into this domain, and I actually had the opportunity to do my own translation work for Netflix in India. Mm -hmm. So my question is a more speculative question. I'm asking you all to speculate, which is, I've encountered, there's a, quite a bit of disdain towards 
the dumped text, I've, no, I've noticed just generally, um, which there doesn't seem to be the same kind of disdain for uh, translation in, in literature or in, in the written form, right? And, and I've, been, I've been trying to understand this, why that is the case, where um, I encounter many people who say, well, I can't watch a dubbed film. I'd rather read the subtitles. And I'm thinking, but you don't have any relationship to this language that you're, you know, like, you know, so like, why do you think reading is somehow more true to, you know, what was being said rather than here, you know, so, so I, so, and I, so I'm actually, because I'm at the very beginning of this project, I'm really trying to, I'm trying to understand, like, what is it about, I mean, is it something about, you know, is it about the performative nature of it versus reading that, you know, or just, I'm just asking, why is, you know, why is it okay to read, you know, read books that are translated, because we obviously don't have access to all of the different, you know, we're not all polyglots, but why is it not so okay to, like, I think watch this is really film, watch a film in, in yeah, it's, it's, it's really the cinema question, it's yeah. because it's nothing to do with text. Cinema is a visual, has its own strong pride as a visual audio form. And I have I made more than ten feature films, and none of my films are dubbed in France or in England. They are Chinese films. Most of my films are dubbed in Germany, and this is really interesting. And I think, I mean, as as a, as a Chinese filmmaker, when I saw my own peasants speaking Chinese dialect with a very political story, and then they were speaking wonderful German in the German yeah. film, I feel quite horrified, sure. and I felt lost to the complete authenticity. Sure. And I insist to they use the subtitles. Now, yeah. now there's other questions on why, you, you ask why can we just read the translated text through literature, but then I come back to the nature of art form. How do we dub a painting? How do we dub a musical? How do we dub a cinema? So I think it goes deep back to the nature of origin of that art form. But, but what I heard you all saying, though, when you were coming to literature, especially Karen, you were saying, you know, uh, this task of selection, and I'm, I'm hearing all of you, and also in response to your question, is that, you know, to kind of get rid of the idea of an original and authenticity, right? You're challenging that. All of your in your discussion, so it's interesting why in cinema. I mean, I'm no, I think that, that, that I think there is something really interesting, and I think it's something that's come up between Shalu and I, which yeah. is that we're dealing with ma two major cultures when we're talking about China and English, right? Sure, sure. And I'm used to dealing, you know, like <laughs> with minor, <laughs> minor Greek, yeah. right? It's and my modern Greek. The beginning of everything. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it's a minor. It's a minor in the Deleuzian sense of minor in the context of the ancient Greek, you know, that kind of, it's like, but it varies minor, and I, I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm thinking, well, dubbing in minor cultures is very creative, like, in Italy and Greece, sure. oh man, you have your actors who read certain actors, and everybody much prefers them than the original, you know, so, so maybe it's... I'm, well, I'm working in India, so I'm looking at the relationship between Hindi and English. So that's so another... Looking, so I'm looking at both Hindi going into English, like that's what I did. I actually wrote the English dub script for a net, major Netflix series while I was doing field work. So, and then my project is also looking at the dubbing of Hollywood films into English, mm -hmm. right? So I'm but I think it has something to do, yeah. with, for me, it, I think it really does have something to do with the, the major language versus the minor language. That there's a creativity that a major language just doesn't have time for. They couldn't care less, they just want to make their own thing. Whereas there's something about a minor language that's kind of, anyway. Yeah, I'm it's interesting sure. because I found dubbing studios, what the kinds of work people were doing in the dubbing studio when they were trying, when they were adapting Hollywood films into Hindi, highly creative. Yeah. Very, like, rich, you know. So, anyway, but it's interesting. It's interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Before we move on to the next question, I just want to mention there's a Columbia alum who did her, um, her doctorate here in Latin American and European cultures who has been for many, many years working as someone who does the, sub, the super titles or the subtitles at the Metropolitan Opera. And there was recently an article, was it in the New York Times? Oh, she yeah. sent it to me. She was interviewed for this article yeah. and, and dealt with all of the, the, the various constraints on yeah. those. And it was quite fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So I highly recommend it. I think it's related also yeah, to the issue it, of yeah. technology. But we have another question. You had your hand yeah. raised. Uh, this is in a slightly different direction, but I guess I'm I'm curious in general about the various theories of opacity that seem to be kind of circulating among the four of you. And I'm 
to just use one example, the cover of your book, I'm curious about what is or isn't at stake in something not being registered as illegible or as opaque to a certain audience, and how, whether it is a visual image or a certain sonic moment, um, if that is being picked up by certain audience members or readers and isn't by others, what kinds of things can happen so that even if the legibility or the intelligibility or the translation doesn't get carried through, the moment of opacity does get carried through. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious about, you know, that's adding yet another dimension to you know the site of translation but how can a certain you know text signal when um, something is actually a barrier and that barrier actually has to be preserved in order for you know the whole um, you know apparatus of the, the sort of complications of the translation to be understood as complicated so quickly I'll, I'll just say I think and I don't know if I represent the translators more broadly in this in this respect, but at least for me, and, and I did lead with sort of the motivations for my translating are pretty political and related to like what I do as a scholar. And so to the extent to which I, I do publish translations as something of an offering to particular communities, it means a great deal to me that that the first encounter with the text, or meant a great deal to me in this case in particular, that the first encounter with the text would immediately start the story for some potential readers. Like, and, I, and, I, and I get this from the classes that I teach to first-generation Haitian students who don't have access to the canonical literature of Haiti because they don't read or speak French, right? So thinking of the possibility of knowing that these are people who this text would have been inaccessible at the very first moment of encounter already says, this is for you, right? Um, and that, that being meaningful because of the resonance of that, that symbol. And then in a very cheesy, utopian way, I do, um, and I don't think I'm an outlier in this, see the points of entanglement and obstacle in, in translations as potential opportunities for readers. I mean, obviously, in my students' results, I just pass over a word you don't know, or pass over a thing that looks weird and go to the thing that doesn't look weird. But for the maybe curious reader that first picked up a book of Haitian literature from the 1980s, is maybe predisposed to do a little bit more thinking and might linger in those moments of hindrance um, and, and open the gate that might seem to be there in what was a barrier but really isn't. Um, so. Yeah, I, I just very much think that opacity, we've been this sort of a running theme about things, I, I, like, I like that you bring it up because it seems like there's this idea that um, you don't have to go to untranslatability. You can actually believe firmly in translatability, but also have places where things are not clear or understood or, or, have, or refracted in different ways. And, and I think that there was a moment where um, I was thinking a little bit about the, the difficulty of reading illiteracy in this. And um, I, I, my, my uh, youngest son is dyslexic, and I found this crazy sans forgetica. It's like this font that's kind of hard to read, so therefore for those who you know, mix B's and D's, it makes you register it, and it basically is a font that has holes in the letters a little bit, very tiny. And I was thinking, well, that's kind of what we're doing at some level, you know, sans forget again. <laughs> it's not untranslatability, but we're letting those places of um, opacity. And, and, um, and, I, and I love um, Kama's sort of willingness to tell us about how this was packaged. And, and no, and to actually have a kind of reading group that you were telling me that, that people are thinking about it, and, which is a kind of utopian controlling of your audience. Oh, for sure. Right? Which is beautiful, right? I mean, it's just not, you know, but there's also something to be said for just knowing that things are going to be deeply misunderstood and that different contexts, you know, the Greek poetry anthology I did was great in England and in America. Everybody thought all the multilingual, weird, you know, rapping poets was fine. In Greece, this is not poetry. Not that, you know? This part of the anthology is poetry. And I learned so much from that misunderstanding, right? So. Well, think about music itself. It's so abstract. There is no words there. Of course, musicians, we, we have our 
vocabulary, our grammar, we use harmony, we use this technique, so on, we can talk to each other, but uh, even, not the audience, even the performer, each of them will play differently. It's impossible to perform the same piece twice, the same way. Th that that makes things so beautiful. We don't need to understand everything. We can feel it. It's interesting to think of a translated text as a score, then, in a way that you know, is available for different you know, interpreters. Well, I'm just giving an example about you know, can I jump in with, a, with an example? Because I was thinking really throughout the whole um, evening here of um, The Rake's Progress, Stravinsky's opera The Rake's Progress, which is a very famous example that has been widely interpreted of intentionally, it seems now, intentionally off text setting. So Stravinsky, in Cal in, living in California, an emigre, setting a text, um, an English text, in this opera, made a lot of choices that actually work against the accentuation of the English. And there's a kind of an intentional, not it's not an intelligibility problem, but there's an intention, no, it's really an opacity. And uh, it's, been, it's been the subject of a tremendous amount of scholarly literature. Why? Why does Germans can make these choices? Some people thought, well, he didn't really know English very well. But I think the more recent consensus, if I remember correctly, is that it is, it is, um, it is willful, and that is a fascinating use of where the, the native language, with its different accentuation of the composer, comes through in the setting of English poetry. And um, anyway, that's, that's, so I kept thinking about that. There, there's a level in which translation can also happen when there's not an actual change of the language that is expressed, when there's the language that is showing through the transparency of, of the artistic. Act, please. Well, I, I wonder if you could think of the choreographer as translating the music, or is that a total uh, no, mixed metaphor? It, it is possible. A friend of mine, his name is uh, Evan Williams. He's a composer, and he show he worked with Max, which is a software where you have full full control on the patches. We make patches, and he did few patches connected to the light, so the dancer, each time she make a gesture, the, uh, the computer start to play. And depending on the gestures, it's long or slow or high or low. So he did it. It's possible to <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is another example which we did with my students, is to improvise with a dancer, without a rehearsal, they are very good, they were very good students. They were harp, oboe, I remember clarinet and cello. And we said, the dancer started and they started to play. That was, it was beautiful. I mean, it happens. Are there are there any further questions or shall we wrap it up? We're magically at five minutes to seven. Point. Well, there's one. Like I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Oh, it's okay. I'm so sorry. I couldn't. I'm short. Yeah. There you okay. go. Please. I have so many questions, but I'll just ask a quick question. So, all of the languages that you know, what is your favorite word that has no direct English equivalent? Oh, oh. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Depends what do you qualify no equivalents of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I think in Japanese the way you pronounce it is koi no yokan, which means love at second sight, and it's the feeling you get when you become friends with someone and you have a feeling that you know you will fall in love with them. So that's literature. That's uh, I think it's very complex narrative, other than translating word to word or word. I think mm -hmm. you're talking about another layer of translation. Mm -hmm. The meaning and the representation. Uh, surely they can be translated or mistranslated in English. <laughs> Does there <laughs> exist a better word than Schadenfreude? <laughs> 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 Let me tell you about a, a word which we, we use in the Middle East and Turkey, which is marhaba. And Turkish people say marhaba. And I wanted to know what is marhaba. And started to search and search. Till I knew that Mar is God and everything is and Hava is love. 
and it's exactly the, the German Austrian Grüß Gott or God bless or something and we say it and we don't know the meaning of the word I mean another situation would be like if you insist on certain cultural identity for example the Chinese culture the ancient ones um, those words qi or in and yang what do we do now just directly use this, the, the, the spelling, yeah, the phonetic spelling, so qi, whether you say chi or yin yang, instead of try to translate its meaning, which is very elusive and complex through the history. Um, so I think translation has adapted the, the, the original um, shape or the sound of, of, of that. Yeah. Or that lady, instead of, instead of wanting to have these untranslatables that we can kind of say that they're so specific to our culture and nobody else that one of the things that is fun about translation is that and i think it happens in multilingual literature so, uh, and, and is that you teach your reader certain words so that's kind of what's happened with chi or something like that it becomes a word that begins to gain meaning and so that's why I find your experiment now of actually teaching us another language with German in this one. <laughs> so we have the Chinese, then we have English, then we have... But I think that that's one way, you know, that you're, the, the language that you're trying to get, you can write it in to your... That those moments, that thing, they become very, very uh, powerful. That's great. I have to say that um, I do a, a lot of translation, but... My, the translation I do is what I would call not literary translation. What you've been all talking about is really literary translation. I do a lot of scholarly translation. And it's very interesting that there are intersecting issues, but at the same time, there are quite a few different things. And I often feel that the role of the scholarly translator is to somehow disappear while also exerting a kind of a intellectual authority over the text and even you know changing the text quite a bit. So I would love, although it's not really relevant to discussion tonight, I would love to have another discussion where people would talk about issues and strategies in the kind of translation that I do, which is of you know people's articles or of medieval texts that I'm simply trying to deliver to readers now who don't know Latin, for instance, that type of translation. Because um, I think that would, I mean, texts that are not literary texts, I have to hasten to add, texts that are very much, much more like documentary type texts, and I think that would be a really fun discussion to have as well. Maybe next year. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for coming.